So let's talk about inductors. First of all, I want to tell you what an inductor is. It's a coiled device. So can you think of anything that uses like a coil? Actually, inductors really work on a, the principle of a magnetic field, like doing work for us. So, um, so what what could possibly have a coiled magnetic or a coil in it? Um, yeah, uh, maybe a puller. Yeah. So that actually, it's not specifically an inductor, but it has inductance. So the principles we're going to learn today. We have to kind of think about them while we're doing drive systems for our motors. Um, this is a really cool inductor, okay? So this is just a coil, okay? And this is specifically an inductor that you would see in a circuit. And we're going to study kind of, we're going to study the principles of, of, of inductors in circuits. Uh, and then we got this little tiny cool inductor here. This is actually, uh, it's actually a pretty big conductor, like something that you would see in a circuit. Uh, that's a pretty big conductor. And then I got a whole bunch of here. Actually, here's a circuit here and it has actually a conductor on it. You can see there's a little coil in there. And that coil is just like an air coil. There's no, there's nothing in the middle of it. This actually is wrapped around something. Um, and this is a surface mount inductor. And then I've got some other inductors over here and you'll see, yeah, you'll see a lot of these kind of inductors like this. This looks very much like a capacitor, but it's actually an inductor. So there you go, lots of, oh, this is kind of a cool inductor that I made. Um, yeah, this is just an experiment that I was working on, uh, and that is an inductor as well. It's just a coiled device. So let's talk about the principle of these things, kind of how they work and, and how they interact with electricity and current and actually what's going on. The, I think the thing that we really have to wrap our heads around is the fact that they produce magnetic fields. And not only do they produce magnetic fields, but when you turn them off, magnetic fields collapse. I think the most important understanding of inductors at this point before we move forward and talk about any of the math or whatever, whatever we look at, is the understanding that magnetic fields are propagated and then they're dissipated. And that actually creates a problem because as you know, magnetic fields, if you have a magnetic field moving through an inductor, it generates EMF. Yeah, Faraday's law, right? So um, it actually, it, it can really help us. It can do some really cool things for us. We can use inductors to our benefit. Also, it's kind of, it's kind of a nuisance actually to deal with them, to deal with the fact that they produce these magnetic fields and then the magnetic fields collapse. Yeah, just very much like a capacitor actually. Capacitors, as you know, they store charge in an electric field. Well, inductors store charge in a magnetic field. And that magnetic field can be really cool. It can do things for us that are cool. Also, it is kind of a little problematic and we'll get into that. But right now, let's just jump into the application of these things and we'll learn how to do the math around them. So I've got this great PowerPoint for you and let's move forward. Welcome to inductors. Here we go. So the agenda, this is all of the stuff we are going to go over. We're going to talk about the basic inductor. Yeah. And then we're going to talk about inductance and in, you know, what induct, you know, what is inductance? So the definition of an inductor and how we calculate inductance, then we're going to get into like, yeah, we're going to put them together in a circuit. We're going to say, Hey, what happens when we put them in parallel and or series? Yeah pretty cool. Um, very much kind of like, you know, what Kirchhoff did. He did all that. We're going to take a look at the rules and the regulations of putting them in series and parallel. We'll also see that, I mean, we did that with capacitors and we'll see that it's actually different from capacitors. It's actually just like resistors. It's more like resistors. And then, then we're going to talk about Faraday's laws and lenses laws. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. And I think, yeah, that's like, that's the whole stick. You guys need to fully understand Faraday's laws and lenses laws to really wrap your head around why an inductor does what it does. Cool. And then we're going to throw um, inductors into DC circuits. And then we're going to throw inductors um, into RL circuits. So resistors and inductors together, both in AC circuits and in DC circuits. Uh, and then we're going to take a look at inductive reactants in application. Cool. So here we go. So this is what's going on here. Okay. So we have an inductor. We're going to define an inductor. Inductors are formed when the length of wire, okay, length of wire is wrapped around some kind of core. Now that core could be actually an iron core. Uh, it could be a ferrite core, or sometimes it's actually just an air core. And there are symbols for that as well. Just like, oh yeah, transformers. Yeah. It sounds pretty much like a transformer. Oh, wait a second. Is a transformer an inductor? <laughs> yeah, dude totally is okay so that's what's going on now the thing is this is like this in the middle of this page it's like magnetic field it's a really big deal so when we wrap a coil when we create a coil and we put 
current through it, a magnetic field is propagated, and then we have this magnetic field. So inductors, all inductors have magnetic field. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we, we charge those magnetic fields, and then we discharge them. And somehow discharging is important too. Yeah. So here we go. This is a really good video. I'm just like, I'm going to open this video because this guy is so cool. Uh, where did I go? Where did I go? Yeah. So we're not going to watch this, but I'm just telling you guys, you really, you really should watch this dude. He's like, he's, he's so cool. He's just the most interesting character. Um, so there you go. So um, shout out to uh, Make Presents, the inductor. Yeah. So um, there you go. So watch that video. It's good. It talks about all different kinds of inductors and like, you know, applications for them. And let's move on to like different kinds of inductors. Dude, there are tons of them. I showed you a bunch of them there. But um, we use them for all different kinds of applications. So the actual inductor itself, like the, oh, where did it go? I had, <laughs> I put my inductors away. Um, but the little little blue thing and the little smaller inductors that I brought out, those are inductors that are actually we put into circuits to help us do things. I mean, yes, I did talk about that this has inductance, but we don't specifically call it an inductor and say, yeah, this thing is an inductor. Um, so when we look at the, the inductors that we go in circuits, those are kind of what we're going to focus on and doing the math with. And then after, I'm going to show you kind of like, how does all of that understanding apply to actually motors and solenoids and other devices that are power devices so moving forward we're just going to say dude for radio tuner noise filters signal filters power line harmonic filters well that's such a cool thing to say power line harmonic filters yeah and oh we can block ac in a circuit and we can pass dc oh huh. can we do that with capacitors too yeah capacitors and inductors are so linked together that just pretty much like the opposite they do exactly the opposite of what the other thing does. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, sensing circuits, for sure. Timing circuits, oh yeah, for sure. So all of these things, we you can see, like if you remember from our lecture on capacitors, a lot of these things were in that same lecture. So we use capacitors and inductors for the same things. Motors, relays, solenoids, and those are specifically, those are things that are powered devices with inductance. We don't call them inductors specifically. There we go. So uh, how do you read an inductor? Well, there's a whole code for reading inductors just like you would have for capacitors, like we talked about in our last lecture on capacitors and resistance, uh, resistors and all the rest of it. So what's going on here is we've got the exact same kind of thing, same chart that we had for uh, finding the resistance. So we have colors, resistance for uh, resistors. Uh, but in this case, we're dealing with inductors. So some inductors have bands on them, colored bands. And there's this whole thing. Uh, there's this chart. So take a look at this chart, figure out how to use it just like resistors. Although you have to understand that when you're calculating your value, it's in micro -henries. Yeah, by the way, inductors are measured in henries. So um, all of the values you will be calculating with this color code are in microhenries. The other thing is that once you see, um, actually, if it's a larger inductor, they just label it. Yeah, it's just labeled. There you go. So these are the different kinds of symbols we use for inductors. And then we've got our air core, our iron core, and our ferrite core. Yeah, totally. Look, the same symbols are used for transformers. I had a hard time saying that word, trans. Formers. Anyway, the same things are used, but um, I'm going to add one here and just put an arrow through it. And, you know, if we put an arrow through anything, it means it's adjustable. So we can see that the symbol for an inductor or inductance, yeah, not the symbol for inductor. So if I like, it, what's the symbol for that inductor? Well, I know it's no symbol for it. It's just, it's just an inductor, dude. But we measure inductance in Henry's. And when we're measuring it, we say, hey, how many... I mean, what is the inductance of that? And inductance is measured in Henry's. So the symbol for inductance is a capital L. We measure it in Henry's, which is a capital H. And those are all of the symbols. There you go. So essentially what's going on here is that the practical inductors, practical inductors are things that we actually use and we apply them to, to kind of benefit us in an electrical circuit just like we do capacitors we throw capacitors and circuits for filters and do all of those things that i just listed on the two slides ago these are practical inductors now again this motor is not an inductor specifically but it has inductance again we'll get into like what once we figure out the rules and regulations and the laws and stuff and the math for all of these things and kind of understand how 
that magnetic field thing is affecting what's going on, we'll be able to actually wrap our head around a powered device with inductance, but we don't call power devices with inductance like motors and solenoids and relays. Specifically, we don't call them practical inductors. Okay, so there's a whole variety of them and you can see all of the different kinds and stuff. And, oh yeah, oh yeah, you can have variable inductors. Oh, that's really cool. Maybe you might need to do that somehow. Yeah, just like we have variable capacitors to tune circuits, we do the same thing with inductors. So this is what's going on. This is, we're gonna jump into the whole magnetic field thing, which I keep highlighting the fact that it's so very important. Inductance, okay? So what is inductance? I mean, yeah, I've mentioned it a few times now. What, in, what is inductance? This is directly from Wikipedia. Inductance is the tendency of an electrical conductor to, up, sorry, yeah, to oppose. I, I'll say that again. Inductance is the tendency of an electrical conductor to oppose a change in the electric current flowing through it. What? Yeah, let's take a look at that. Now, this is actually really cool. This is what's called back EMF. Back EMF is really important that you understand that. But, I mean, we're going to get it. This is all about Faraday's and Lenz's laws, but let's just see how it works for now. Okay, here we go. So, um, I've got a, whether this is an iron core or any kind of core, it doesn't matter where the core is. Let's talk about this coil. So I am going to put current, there's current in the coil. So the current is going up here. It's going that way. It's going around and around and around and around and around. So when that happens, there's actually current produced in the opposite direction. Really? Yeah. It's weird, eh? Yeah, that's totally weird. So just, yeah, like pause on that. Just do this. Let's do this again, dude. When we put current this way through a coil, actually there's current that goes the other way or more specifically, there's back EMF. So there's electromotive force or voltage that's created in the opposition to the current that's actually creating the magnetic field in the first place. Yeah, we'll talk about that when we get into Faraday's laws and Lenz's laws. But I mean, this is the concept of an inductor. That's like the main principle of an inductor or more specifically inductance in an inductor is the tendency of an electrical conductor to oppose a change in the electrical current, which flows through it. It's weird. So when you power it up, it kind of goes, no, 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 no. It, actually, that's exactly what it does. It creates resistance. And we actually call it reactance. Let's move forward. Here we go. Yeah, it creates resistance when we put current through it. Here we go. So now, you can actually calculate inductance. Um, so inductance is based on the physical properties of the actual inductor itself. And this is all of the form, this is the formula here that we take a look at it. So it has to do with the number of turns for sure. Not only the number of turns, but the number of turns squared. Dude, it's to the squared. So if you want twice the inductance, yeah, just, just, you don't even have to twice up the coils. You just one, whatever the root of two is. <laughs> okay. There you go. However many times. So, um, yeah, I mean, increasing the inductance is pretty easy. Uh, and then we also have the permeability, you know, the permeability of the core itself. We're not going to get into the physics of why that is true. Um, and the length of the actual coil matters itself um and as well as the cross-sectional area uh and there you go and then that's the inductance so i'm not going to get into like how and why we calculate this in depth i'll just show you an explanation an explanation here where we have a situation here where we have all of those parameters we throw them into a formula we put the units into the formula now, did i say to put the units in the formula yeah and then you get an answer in this case it's 5.5 Milli Henry. Yeah, you're going to see Milli Henry's. You're going to see Henry's. You're going to see Micro Henry's. You may not see Pico or Nano Henry's or anything, but you're definitely going to see Milli Henry's and Micro Henry's numbers that, you know, get used to those. So let's put some of these guys together in series and in parallel and see what the formula is. Yeah, it's just like putting resistors in series and parallel and the formulas are exactly the same. So there you go. There's that, uh, that, that that, that, we don't need to go over those. Actually, we'll kind of go back just for a second. Dude, if I had a bunch, if I had a, a bunch, yeah, <clears throat> I'm having a hard time speaking. If I had a bunch of capacitors, sorry, inductors, well, I just start that all over again. If I had a bunch of inductors in series and I needed to calculate the total inductance and I knew the inductance of each one of them, I could just use this formula here and I could just all add them up, right? No big deal. 
and uh, there's two examples of adding them up. I wanted to pause and actually stop on this a little bit. Just, just these are all Henrys, no big deal. One, one, two Henry, just uh, add them up. Here, look at this one, it's pretty cool. We got five milli Henrys, two milli Henrys, 10 milli Henrys, and then 1,000 micro Henrys. So how do I do the math there? Do I actually have to write a formula and put the unit for every single one of them? Well, no, we can do the math with the units, right? I can throw milli Henrys on the outside, but in this case, as opposed to putting a thousand, I'm just going to put one. Dude, metric prefixes are so important. If you haven't wrapped your head around the metric prefixes yet, and you haven't wrapped your head around like what they mean and how many zeros they actually represent, and actually the the times ten to the whatever multiplier, just get on that because as we go forward into this course and into and all of your other control courses, you're going to start using that a lot. And if you can't just automatically just say, oh yeah, a thousand micro Henry's is a milli Henry. Yeah, okay, I get that. If you can't just easily do that, it's a problem. Just practice that. So there you go. So I've got a thousand micro Henry's, that's a milli Henry, and I put it down. Now, when we put these guys in parallel, the formula is exactly like the formula we use for putting resistors in parallel. And there we go. So there's an example here. Let's take a look at it. I got 1.2 milli Henry's, 3 milli Henry's. Oh. 1100 micro henrys what is that well dude that's just 1.1 millihenries and you just know that so i'm going to put it all in my formula here and i'm going to put millihenries on the outside because it's all millihenries in this case it's going to be oh i put 1.2 oh i don't know what i'm doing oh well just fix that that should say 1.1 obviously uh and then there you go so that's 500 so i actually probably typed in that i'm not sure if that's true or not but let's just move forward okay here we go same with this guy so this is uh 0.44 millihenries you should just know that yeah so i just put it in my formula like this boom and there you go so that's the answer moving forward that's how you do that the math is not complicated Let's get into some like some meat and let's just talk about what's going on here. So look at this. Okay, good. So when I close this switch, what happens is this is DC source, by the way, right? Just taking a look at I'm, I'm creating a I'm putting DC onto an inductor. When I close the switch, a magnetic field propagates. It just goes right, and then it just stays like that as long as the switch is closed. And then when we open the switch, it goes and that up and down. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. We're going to see what actually happens. Take a look at this. When we're charging an inductor, yeah. So essentially, you know, charging a capacitor is something that you're okay with. You're like, yeah, charge a capacitor. How do you, do you charge an inductor? Actually, yeah, because capacitors are charged and they, they hold their charge in an electric field. And then you can just undo them and walk around with them and they hold their charge. Inductors, they do the same thing, except once you disconnect them, they're charge goes away so it's a very temporary thing but we'll see that when we put them in ac when we charge them quickly and discharge them charge them quickly they act exactly like capacitors but kind of in reverse okay so um let's just take a look at the charging and discharging and imagining yeah we're charging it as we charge it this propagation that the, the magnetic field propagates and that's the charging of it it's holding the charge in that magnetic field and then when we release the charge it does this so what does that look like over time? Well, dude, this is the exact same kind of time chart that we saw with capacitors. It's actually the same. I mean, the timing is exactly the same. So tau is just looking like this. It's actually, in this case, it's L divided by R because when we looked at tau before for a capacitor, it was C, I mean, it was, it was L, L, <laughs> it was C times R. What had a hard time there. It was C times R. In this case, we're doing L divided by r so it's a little different but the charging curve looks the same yeah so it takes a certain amount of time to charge it and we know that one time constant tau one time constant is 0.63 charge so it's the amount of time it takes to charge the thing 63 percent now when we talk about like fully charged like what is it fully charged dude it doesn't fully charge for like a long time like probably a hundred time constants you know, a long time until it's just actually never fully it's an asymptotic charging rate it never fully 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 charges i guess at some point it does i really don't i've never analyzed it that far that doesn't really matter what we wanted to know is like well okay if it takes like a certain time constant to charge to 63 percent well what's the time constant or what's the amount of time for like a full charge because you kind of need to know that because you know you're going to 
calculate, you're going to put that in some formulas and stuff. Dude, just multiply it by five. It's just five times the amount of time it takes to charge at 63%. And then you're good. And that's exactly what we do for capacitors. So no big deal, whatever. Let's just, let's just move forward and take a look at the principle of the magnetic field and what it actually does. Okay, so Faraday's law, the amount of voltage induced in a coil is directly proportional to the rate of change of the magnetic field with respect to the coil. What? How do we induce voltage in a, in a coil? Well, essentially we take a coil and um, if we have a magnetic field that's changing in that coil, it induces voltage. Faraday's law. No big deal. And you can even to the point where essentially you can take a, a wire and move a magnetic field past the wire and you will induce voltage. Okay, I mean, you know, whatever. We, we did that in another course. No big deal. You can put a coil. You can have a coil and I can put a magnetic field across the coil and it does that. Okay, so that's not a big deal. Okay, Faraday's law is the fact that we're inducing, we call it EMF, electromotive force, EMF. We're inducing EMF if there is a changing magnetic field in the presence of a coil. No big deal. Let's move on. Lenz's law. Dude, it, it adds is it adds is is it adds a level of yeah just kind of complexity to this now i've got this great video on lenses law in 17 minutes jump on it if you want and watch it it's a good video i'm not gonna i'm not gonna fire that thing up it talks in depth about lenses law and about what's going on but what's happening is that lenses law is essentially this okay so the fact is that when we put electricity through a coil, okay, when we put electricity through a coil, it generates a magnetic field. Now, the thing is, the magnetic field being propagated is a changing magnetic field. Well, Faraday's law comes in and says, well, a changing magnetic field creates EMF. Well, guess what? That EMF is in opposition to the current that made the magnetic field in the first place. So let me just, let me sit on that one more time. I have this coil, it's empty. Nothing's happening to it. Here, where's my coil? Nothing's going on with this coil. Now, there's no magnetic field here. If I put electricity through it, magnetic field happens. It changes, the changing magnetic field. Now that changing magnetic field, through Faraday's law, actually creates this EMF. But it's in opposition to the current or to the polarity of the voltage that created the magnetic field in the first place. Yeah, essentially that is what's going on with Lenz's law. So just watch that video and wrap your head around that a little bit. But essentially what we're gonna do is when we talk about reactants, the back EMF that's generated in this, when this magnetic field is propagated, it generates EMF in the opposition to the EMF that created it in the first place. And that opposition is essentially resistance or reactance. Yeah. So I, I dive into that pretty deeply in this in this great video. So watch that if you want. But essentially, you can just forget about that and move on. Understanding that this reactance or the resistance that exists in a coil is due to uh, Lenz's law. That's like it's huge. Now let's just take a look at some of these. Um, uh, we're going to take a look at the time curves and stuff, and the charging and discharging and stuff. More specifically, when we put a resistor in the circuit. Okay, so we're gonna actually put a, a coil into a circuit or an inductor into a circuit in series with a resistor and we're gonna put DC and AC through it and then we're gonna study what happens and then we'll see some formulas kind of wrap around uh, with that. So, so moving forward, let's do that. So what's going on is that you do understand that when there's current going through the magnetic field, which is created from EMF pushing in the first place, whether that's from AC or DC, doesn't matter. And that is then going to create this magnetic field. And that then creates back EMF, which pushes the current and says, no, you can't come in here. And that is the resistance or what we call the reactance. Um, and that's actually what's going on. So whether it's AC or DC, it's all really about, it boils down to Lenz's law that's actually creating that resistance that we call reactance. I've got a resistor in the circuit, okay? Now what happens when I have a switch, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this switch. All right, I'm going to close the switch and what happens? That's essentially what happens. Watch this. Now, these are two charts. Okay, this is the voltage and that's the current. Okay, so what we're looking at when an inductor is connected in series with the resistor and DC source 
uh, is applied, the current changes exponentially. Okay, so what's going on at first is the voltage drop across the inductor, this is the voltage drop across the inductor, okay? So initially, the voltage drop across the inductor is very high. And the reason is because there's no current traveling through it, and it actually is very much like an open switch. It's very much like an open switch. Or more specifically, as it starts to propagate that magnetic field, it, that's when the highest back EMF exists. When the highest back EMF exists, it's like it's a really strong resistor. So if it's a really strong resistor at first, because that back EMF is really strong, just when that, because the magnetic field is propagating and the most motion that happens at the very instant that magnetic field is, starts to propagate, that's when the greatest motion is. And we know that Faraday's law says the faster, the faster that magnetic field is moving, the greater the EMF produced. In this case, that magnetic field propagating creates this really strong back EMF, which is really high resistance. And we know that a really high, a really high resistor in a circuit has got really high voltage drop across it. So in this case, the voltage drop across the coil is really high, but the current going through the coil is, is ridiculously low because the resistance is so high. As time goes on, that magnetic field starts to propagate and it slows down its propagation. The movement of that magnetic field slows down a little bit. The back EMF is less and less and less and less. And we can see that the voltage drop across the coil decreases because its resistive nature, called reactance, decreases. And eventually, well, and the current goes up because the resistance decreases and it decreases. And eventually when the magnetic field goes and it stabilizes, then there's no more back EMF and the current just goes through it. And then it's just like a wire. That's pretty cool. So um, if we take a look at this, the, re the resistor is actually really important. We're going to take a look at the fact that the current through the resistor and no, let's talk about voltage drop. The voltage drop across the resistor and the voltage drop across the coil are different. Yeah. And actually the the current and stuff is all different and stuff too. So we'll, we'll take a look at some of those kind of time charts, but we saw that exact same thing happening when we looked at, um, when we looked at uh, capacitors and that there was this phase difference. Yeah, and then we're gonna see that exact same thing happening, although it's kind of opposite. So here we go. So um, the current, the final current is just gonna be like Ohm's law. There you go. I mean, this, this essentially reactance is gone. The reactance is gone. So the total current is gonna have to do entirely with this resistor. Now, when I said entirely, I lied to you, but like really like 99.99% of the resistance in this circuit has to do with this resistor. Um, so yeah, it's just like, this is just a wire. It's not even in the circuit anymore. Once the, once the magnetic field propagates and it's done, that's actually five time constants. Yeah, there you go. So moving on, let's just take a look at what's going on here. And this is kind of about the charge and the discharge and how it affects the current. So essentially what's going on, initially this switch is open. So right here, I mean, let's just say we hook this up and we just let it fully sit there and the, the magnetic field propagated and it charged and whatever. As soon as I hook the battery up and I let it fully charge, I went five time constants and it's not a problem. So now there's current running through here and that current is pr pretty much entirely drawn by this resistor, by R1, and that's why the current exists. Now, when I change this, what's gonna happen is that it's gonna draw more current, or at least R2 is going to want to draw more current, right? And so at the beginning, uh, so R2 attempts to draw more current because I've changed this. R2 attempts to draw more current, but during that process, the magnetic field propagates, that coil is going to create reactants or back EMF, and it's gonna say no. I'm not going to allow this current to go because it becomes a really high resistor. It has reactants. So there's no actually, actually any extra current at all. And you can see from this slide, there's, there's the current here. And from this slide, there's the current. But what happens here? After a certain amount of time, right, that magnetic field propagates and there's no longer any back EMF. And in this case, what's going to happen is the current is going to actually go high because now I've added a resistor and it's drawing more current and it's good. But at first, when I close this switch at first, when I just bam, I just close the switch, there's actually no extra current at all. Huh, it's kind of weird until those five time constants where that magnetic field has 
fully propagated or the the um, the inductor has fully charged and there's no longer any back EMF. And then what's going to happen is that this is just going to be like a circuit where we're talking about the current is the voltage divided by the entire resistance. There you go. Uh, and so this is what's going on when we take a look at the voltage across the resistor and the voltage across the inductor. And we can see that these guys kind of act backwards to each other. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a circuit and I'm going to throw a square wave at it. Okay, so I've got an RC circuit, an RL circuit, pardon me, I'm throwing a square wave at it, and this is actually what's going on. So as soon as I close the switch, or sorry, I've got the switch closed. As soon as I have this voltage go up, the instant the voltage goes up, the voltage drop across the resistor is very, very low. And that's because the current is very, very low. But the voltage drop across the inductor is huge because in the beginning, it's like a huge resistor. It's almost like an open circuit. So the voltage drop across it is going to be huge. Actually, the voltage drop across that, if you was a, that was actually an open circuit and I stuck a DMM on there, it would show the voltage of the source. So that's why it's actually up at the top. As that magnetic field starts to propagate, the back EMF is less and less and less. So therefore, there's current that flows. Because there's current, we actually see some voltage drop across the resistor because there's some current. Ohm's law. That's basic, okay? There's current going through the resistor. That means it has a voltage drop. But the thing is, the back EMF of the inductor is not as much because that, that field is not propagating as quickly. So therefore, the nature of its resistance changes and it actually decreases. So therefore, actually the voltage drop across it decreases. And eventually, until five constant, five time constants later, then essentially there's no more magnetic field propagating. There's no more back EMF the inductor no longer has resistance or reactance and there's no more voltage drop across it and the entire voltage drop is now across the resistor and we can see how that's high now this is just this is the two of them together this is the capacitor and an inductor we can see that they're actually opposite make note that this is vc and that's vr and that's vr and that's lr so essentially if you take a look at these two i mean i'm going to leave you this slide for you to just wrap your head around we're not going to get into the depth of this but essentially the i just the thing you've got to learn from this is that inductors and capacitors are actually opposite they're out of phase what they do what they do by pushing current and voltage out of phase is is they do it oppositely so we know what's going on here we know that the voltage drop across the resistor is low at first an inductor and the voltage drop across the inductor at first is really high. Well, over here, it's, it's the other way around. The voltage drop across a capacitor is really low at first, and the voltage drop across a resistor is really high. Go back to the capacitor uh, PowerPoint and just wrap your head around that. Let's just move forward. I just need this, the, power, the point of this slide is just to say they're different. Here we go, let's move on. Now we're going to put inductors with AC circuits. So essentially what's going on is that as long as there's a lot of a lot of changing like if there's ac the voltage is changing all the time okay so voltage is changing all the time the magnetic field in the inductor is changing all the time yeah so when the magnetic field in the inductor is changing because of lentis law it creates back emf so if that's happening all the time then then inductors hooked up to ac pretty much have resistance all the time or what we call reactants yeah so the one thing that's, um, I guess, important to note here is that this is actually opposite from what a capacitor does. Because we know with capacitors, the higher the frequency, the lower the reactance. The lower the frequency, the higher reactance, the reactance. In this case, with inductors, they're just actually proportional. So the higher the frequency, the higher the resistance or the reactance. The lower the frequency, the lower the resistance or what we call the reactance. There we go. Uh, at zero frequencies or DC, there's actually no resistance. Like, once it propagates, after five time constants, there's no more resistance left. But there is just at the beginning a little bit. Um, and the resistance in this, this case is called reactance. Um, and based upon this, an inductor can be used to block or pass frequencies. Yeah, just actually like an RC 
filter circuit, we can actually make an RL filter circuit. And guess what? It works opposite. Yeah, I don't even have one in this PowerPoint, but I'm saying when we had our RC, we know that when the C was on the top and the R was here, right? So we have our power source, our AC, and we have our C here and our R here on outputs here, right? The, that is a high pass filter because the capacitor was on the top. And when we get the, capa put the capacitor here and the re resistor here, that's a low pass filter because the resistor, the capacitor was lower. It's a low pass. Well, in when we do an RL circuit, an RL filter circuit, it's the opposite. Yeah, a low pass filter has the inductor up here and the resistor here, and a high pass filter has the inductor here and a resistor there. Whatever, no big deal. I'm not gonna get into that specifically because we're not gonna be using, um, we're not gonna be studying filter circuits with inductors, but just kind of heads up that you know. Now, what do you think the formula for inductance is? Well, we know the formula for so, uh, yes, reactance, pardon me. We know the formula for capacitive reactance, and that's one over some stuff. Well, in this case, guess what? It's just directly proportional. Yeah, we just do two pi FL. There you go, and that's it. So essentially, just real quick example here. The reactance of a 33 millihenry inductor when a frequency is 55, uh, 550 kilo ohms. Yeah, I said kilo. Kilo ohms is gonna be 114 kilo ohms. Easy, just do the math. But if we have that same inductor and the frequency is now 550 hertz, not, I think I said kilo ohms. I'm not sure what I said. 550 kilohertz in our previous example. This example is 550 hertz. Well, it's actually a thousand times less. So, so is the resistance. It's a thousand times less. Um, there you go. There's no kilo here. No big deal. Whatever. It's easy. Okay. So let's actually do a little bit of math here and apply this formula that we just learned. Uh, into an application, to an example here. So we we know our um, our frequency. The voltage in this case doesn't really matter because we're just looking to find out the reactance, okay? So I throw my values into my formula. I got five millihertz, and I know that I've got one kilo ohm, and I just throw it together, and uh, my total reactance is 31.4 ohms. Yeah, it's measured in ohms, just, just like capacitive reactants is measured in ohms. In this case, um, when then, I, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Ohm's law, which is pretty cool because, you know, we can use Ohm's law if we have a Z. Yeah, we can use Ohm's law if we have a Z. So whenever we actually have a Z, which is impedance, when we calculate the total impedance, then, dude, we can just throw it right into Ohm's law and we're good. We're good to go. But in this case, because we don't have a resistor in the circuit, the total impedance is actually equal to the inductive reactance. So inductive reactance equals Z. So I can throw the value for the inductive reactance right into my Ohm's law and I can calculate current. So in this case, I got 24 volts um, and uh, the inductance is 31.4 ohms because the reactance is 31.4 ohms and there's no resistor. So inductance equals reactance. Uh, impedance, pardon me. Did I say not impedance before? Dude, let me just back up here. The Z stands for impedance. I think I said that. I'm sorry if I didn't. Yeah, Z is impedance. Um, so inductive reactance is going to be the same. I'll just move forward. Here we go. So now that's the current. So we got 673 milliamps in this circuit. Now, just to note, that's after five time constants. Or is it? No. This is AC. It's changing all the time. So because it's changing all the time, that's, dude, that is actually the current all the time in this circuit. Well, we know that the current's kind of changing quickly, but it's changing 1,000 times a second. So whatever, the, the average current, uh, or the RMS current actually, in this case, the RMS current uh, is going to be um, 763 milliamps, there you go. But it's always the same. And the capacitive reactance of this doesn't change because it's an AC signal. Okay, there you go. So now let's just talk about phase. Now, this is review, okay, this is review. We know that current and voltage, so the voltage drop across the capacitor and the current through the capacitor are 90 degrees out of phase. And we know that the current is leading the voltage because when we initially start to charge, when we initially apply voltage source to a capacitor, current just goes flying in, right? Until it's charged, it has very little voltage, right? So the current is really high at first and the voltage is really low until it fully gets charged and then the voltage is high because it's fully charged. So what's happening there is current is leading voltage. So taking a look at an inductor in the same kind of thing, we can see that the voltage drop across the inductor 
actually leads the current. So at any point in time, the voltage drop across the inductor leads the current. And that's because at first, right, that when we start to try and charge that capacitor, it's its resistance is very high, or reactance is very high, and then because it's high, the current is going to be low, and the voltage drop across it is going to be low because it's like an open circuit. But then as that magnetic field fully propagates, the resistance or the reactance of it lowers, and then the current gets high. So that's kind of opposite to what I just said about the capacitors. The way we can remember this is we just look at this guy, okay? So this is this is just kind of a little a little thing to say. It's civil, and in this case, when we're dealing with an inductor, we know that the voltage leads the current in an inductor. The voltage leads the current in an inductor, and uh, L stands for inductor. So it's just another little way to remember what's going on. I don't even think about that, dude. I just remember the physics of what's actually going on with capacitors and inductors, and then I just can put it together. There you go. So uh, in this particular situation, we've got a, an ideal inductor. Okay, so there's this concept of an ideal inductor, and that is essentially what's going on is it is an ideal inductor um, that doesn't have any internal resistance, but that doesn't actually exist. Ideal inductors are just fictitious because, yeah, because what's going on is that the actual inductor is made of a wire and the wire has resistance. I mean, it's really, really small. But what we do is if we need to represent that, most of the time we just kind of forget about it because it's so small it doesn't affect anything and I'll show you that in a PowerPoint, I mean in a slide uh, coming up, that it doesn't really affect kind of the total reactance or the total impedance of the circuit, it doesn't really affect it. Um, sometimes it comes into play when we have really low frequencies, but in this case like really low. Uh, but in this case, let's take a look at this. This is actually the symbol. If we needed to represent the internal resistance of an inductor, we use this symbol. Let's just take a look at kind of the math and what's going on here. You guys have seen this before, and you've seen this when we talked about capacitors and that we have this impedance triangle, and we're gonna do that again, and we're gonna calculate the total impedance. But in this case, this is the, essentially what's going on. This is RW, okay? so. It's the resistance of the winding. And in this case, it's 3.3 ohms. It's actually pretty high for a winding. It's probably a really long winding. It's probably like this this long. It's probably a really big winding. So that's 3.3 ohms. Actually, this is probably more than, this is probably about 15 ohms or 20 ohms because um, it's really thin wire. So uh, let's say 3.3 ohms. And then we have our inductance is 100 millihenries. So what do we do about this? Well, we have to calculate the total impedance. And in this case, You've seen this formula before. You've seen these formulas before, but let's just, uh, before we move on, let's just say uh, in an RL circuit, the total impedance is the phasor sum of the R and the XL. I mean, you recognize this from capacitive circuits. I just need to mention that the fact is, actually, this is actually really important. XL, okay, inductive reactance goes up. Capacitive reactance goes down, which is actually really cool. And will come into play when we put capacitors and inductors and resistors into a circuit. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So uh, just to note that they're backwards, but here's just an example here. We know this formula, we recognize this formula impedance. Guess what? It's the exact same formula for capacitive impedance as opposed to, I mean, as including inductive impedance. Uh, and then we know that our angle for theta is the exact same formula. It's just the inverse tan. But in this case, it's XL over R as opposed to XC over R. So let's just take a look at an example here. So we've got an example here. So what we're gonna say is that for this particular circuit with a very, very low resistance or winding resistance, and we've got 100, uh, 100 milli uh, Henry's, we're just gonna do the math, okay? So we're gonna step by step. The first step is to calculate the inductive reactance, and we've done that. And then from there, we're gonna calculate the total impedance, which is really no different. Here we go, 62.83 and 62.91. So at 100, even at a low value, even a low value of 100 hertz, you know what? It doesn't really make a big, big difference. So this, this winding resistance doesn't really get into play. Although, like I did say, in this case, that's probably about 20 ohms. So if I had, if I had 20 ohm winding resistance and I put a low frequency, I put 100 hertz through this, well, we're gonna see that there's actually a, you know, that's actually gonna create a steeper angle. Um, and my impedance triangle or my impedance is gonna be much greater value than the inductive reactance. 
Um, there you go. So in this case, it's very, very small. I've got a 92.9, a 62.9 as opposed to 62.8. So essentially what we can do is we can pretty much just like forget about it. We can assume that the RW is just negligent and not even throw it into our formulas. So in that case, I'm just going to put another example up here where I'm actually just putting a resistor into the circuit. I'm not showing my RW. It's not even even on this diagram, but I'm saying there's a resistor here. If the resistor is a thousand ohms, which is pretty pretty big, then what's going to happen is my impedance triangle is going to have a different angle, and my impedance value is going to be larger as well. So here we go. So step there are three steps. Step one, I calculate my inductive reactance. I just throw in the formula here, and then I calculate my total impedance. And you can see the total impedance in this case is much greater than my capacitive reactance. And by the way, that should say that that period should be gone. I just noticed it now. So I'm going to change that. That should just be 1969, which is actually 1.969 kilohertz. I'm just kind of maybe throwing these things in here so you get used to using your um, metric prefixes. Uh, there you go. So over here, I'm just going to put these two values in here and I got my angle here. And you can see the angle is actually quite larger. OK, so it's a large angle. Um, and that's that's what's going on. That's my impedance triangle. OK, so now we know the math. I want to move forward on to um, just taking a look at um, my impedance of an RL circuit, essentially with like looking at the fact that my line goes up as opposed to going down because when we had sorry not impedance reactance the reactance goes up as opposed to down because when we had capacitive reactance our triangle went down and when we had when we have inductant reactance it goes up and it goes up if the frequency increases so essentially what we're doing here is we're just taking a look at this and as we know in this case as the frequency goes up the inductive reactance goes up as well and it actually goes up Okay, as opposed to going down. Okay, there you go. So now let's just talk about this. Okay, so what we've got is we've got benefits and we've got problems. And uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, there are a lot of things here I could put in the problems. But the benefits are to this particular situation that we have this type of reactance is that we can you build filter circuits with it and they work really well. So we can actually do filter circuits with this. Now the problem is the current and voltage are out of phase. And that creates inefficiencies for powered coil devices. Yeah, like motors that run on AC and any other kind of current powered device that runs on AC, like a speaker. Yeah, that's that's AC also. Uh, and also like what we're talking about, uh, other devices like solenoids and stuff. But essentially what's going on here is that, take a look at this. And this actually probably will be really interesting to you. And I think it'll go click, click, click. Like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Take a look at this. Okay, I've got my motor here. It's a huge inductor. It has a lot of inductance. Uh, and then I've got my AC motor going on here. And as we can see, the voltage and the current are out of phase from each other, right? Now, they're not always 90 degrees out of phase. We won't get into that right now, but essentially, however you look at it, they're out of phase. So if in this particular situation, if we want to calculate power, which is just current times voltage, right? There's a problem. Yeah, dude, they're not in phase. The current and the voltage, not in phase. So when I multiply the values of each, it creates a problem. Take a look at it. At 90 degrees, right here, the power of this is zero. There's no power. None at all, right? Because the voltage actually is high, but the current's low. And then at 180 degrees, I got the same problem over here, but in reverse. And then 130 degrees, kind of in between, I've got this kind of value here that's not quite right. Yeah, so it creates a real problem. And there are ways to get around that. And the way we get around that is actually, it's pretty cool. We throw a capacitor in the circuit yeah, and that helps to shift these things and put them back in phase again. Essentially, then we're doing an RLC circuit. So the last application in this case, which is, that's it for the PowerPoint. I don't want to talk to you guys anymore, uh, is an inductive flyback. Uh, inductive flyback. And what's going on here is that, I mean, you can sit with this slide for a little bit. I'll just explain this, and you can read this slide later on if you want. But essentially what's going on here, if you take a look at the circuit, you can see that I've got a switch. Now, let's just say the switch is closed, okay? And the motor's running, okay? The motor's running, switch is closed, that's fine. When Now, that motor, okay, has a magnetic field. It's been charged with that magnetic field because it has inductance. Now, when I open that switch, that magnetic field starts to drop when it drops that creates emf but in this case it's not back emf remember how we were talking about back emf and that was created when the magnetic field is propagating right but in this case the magnetic field is dropping 
still have a changing magnetic field. It creates EMF. But the thing is, that EMF actually tries to draw more current. It becomes like a little battery. Huh? So that the actual coil itself becomes a battery. And it says, give me more current, dude, give me more current. And actually, as that switch is being opened, it creates an arc across the switch. And if that switch is a some kind of device that like a transistor or another more sensitive device transistors are really very sensitive essentially if we're using some kind of transistor logic at all to control us what's happening is that we're actually creating a real problem for our transistors we damage those transistors because of this forward emf that's generated from the the disintegration of that magnetic field and it's called flyback inductance okay so essentially what's happening here is it creates a real problem so what we do is we throw a diode on the circuit and this is pretty cool so when i open this this guy wants to make current he wants to make current so i just give him a path and the path goes wee like this and it actually creates some current and then you're not frying your switch and or your transistor and that's all you need to know i don't i think that's it yeah that's all okay,